And Margaret, how does, if we're thinking about organisations, how do um, strengths and the strengths that we recognise play into ideas about cultural fit, quote unquote cultural fit? Um, yeah. And at Parlour, we're always wary of the notion of cultural fit yeah. because it yeah. can very often be a mask for bias. Yeah. Um, and people are actually looking for people who are just like themselves. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Mm. So how does strength, strength organisational strengths play into that? How do we avoid? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's quite a complex uh, question that you, you've asked, and I agree with you. I think it's, um, it goes to the, the, whole, um, the whole notion of uh, what is culture and how is it established. So for me, culture is very simply put the way we do things around here. And it's, it, it involves a, a set of, of norms and, uh, and, and those norms are values-based, collectively values-based, and there are behaviours that should be articulated around, well, how do we do those values that we... That we so if we've, got, um, if we've got a value like uh, trust or respect in our cultural norm, then how do we do, cultural, uh, how do, we do uh, trust and respect here? What does it look like in practice? The thing about fit for me, it's not about fit to a personality type or to a style of working. It's fit to those values. You can't be in a culture if you don't have alignment with the, with the shared value set. And if you don't have a sense of connection to the shared outcome of that workplace as well. So when, when it's used to talk about, well, you're not like me, therefore you don't fit, I, I actually get quite cross too. So I get what you're saying. It's, it's, you know, we can tolerate an enormous amount of diversity if we're all aligned more or less to those shared values and we understand and practice those behaviours and we have the skills and expertise to contribute to the priorities um, of the organisation. So it, it really does, um, it's the bias that selection processes have that you're talking about. And that's what you've got to be really careful about. My suggestion was, would be always have an outsider on the panel who will challenge you around those, uh, who will challenge those bias, mm -hmm. that bias, sorry. Mm. Um, Brian Cloacy is uh, in the conversation. He's suggested the term cultural ad. I haven't heard that before, Brian. Do you want to explain what that is? Hi, Naomi. Um, uh, it's just that we've, when we did some unconscious bias training, someone said that this notion of cultural fit would start to get us, we, we, would, we would bring our biases to it and look to them in a different yes. way. And they, I thought, had a lovely suggestion where they said, think of it as cultural ad. Well, well what would they bring that would actually stretch ah. our culture and make us more diverse than that? And I really loved it. So we yeah. changed the question in that because I... I have to confess, I used to love talking about cultural fit and how you would come in and fit yeah. in, in our organisation. And since we flipped it to add, I really like it because it makes us think as reviewers when we go back over uh, someone yeah. who we just met, well, how would they add to the culture? Not like yeah. how are they going to fit in here? What would they bring to it that maybe we don't have already? And I think it, it opens up in a really nice way the possibility of our, uh, the strengths or something that, or the differences that that person has that would be really good for yeah, awesome. absolutely. That's lovely. Thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to steal that if I may. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I guess the other thing about that, Brian, is that cultural fit tends to imply that the organisation will stay the same, whereas yes. cultural ad tends to imply evolution and change. Precisely. And the the other thing that is really important, I think, when you when you describing culture, is describe it using an iterative narrative. So it goes to what you've just said, Naomi. It's not static. An iterative narrative will develop and emerge and change, particularly in the current times of fluidity. I mean, there's week to week things are changing. So what's our narrative? So who are we? What do we stand for? What's our, our sense of purpose? Um, what are our priorities? What do we value? What are the behavioural protocols that we support or not support? And in that narrative, and there's threads, you can kind of combine the threads in any way you like for different audiences too. But leaders particularly, and managers, team leaders, who, wherever you are, if you're responsible for people, you need to have um, a good, hopeful, future-focused narrative, particularly at the moment, mm -hmm. which encapsulates all that you're talking about. 